um, for the formations of the So yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It's really a nice place to visit. You know, like you don't see flowers in Ann Arbor like until May or June or something. Yeah, so I'm going to report on this uh, work on the MMP for deformations of Hubert MP2. This is a joint work with uh, Chun Yi Li, who's a grad student in Un U University of Illinois. Yeah, so although my title is about this deformation of Hubert MP2, but I do really want to like start with the case of Huber scheme of points on P2. So, so these two things like sh share some common part. I want to start with something we are familiar with. Yeah. So the first thing I just want to recall something from this uh, bridge land stability conditions on P2. Yeah. This is really a nice story. So the per so so basically we want to construct some bridge land stability conditions on P2. And the first way to do this is by, via this called tilting method. And you get something like uh, AS and ZPS, depending on two parameters, S and T, okay, for T positive. And uh, S could be an arbitrary a real number. So how do we do this? So basically, we first take a so-called tilting of this uh, uh, abelian category of coherent sheaves on P2. So fix a uh, real number t, and you consider all the coherent sheaf on uh, P2 such that either it's torsion or yeah, the mu minus of this thing is at least s. And by this, I mean you take the you, you know, you write down the harder narrow simham filtration of this thing, and you require the, the minimal slope in, in the semi-stable factor is at least s. Okay? Yeah. And also, you can take fs to be, you know, all the coherent sheaf in P2. Uh, Mumford G seeker. Yeah. You, you write down the, you know, the. Uh, no, yeah. So, okay. So, for this. I really need it to be torsion free and the mu plus mg of this f is less than or equal to s. Okay, so this is called like a torsion pair or something of this uh, category of coherent sheaves on P2. <coughs> and so, yeah, so the upshot is once you have this thing, then you have a T structure on the derived category, derived category of coherent sheaves. So basically, this T structure is given by, the take this D is uh, greater than or equal to 0 to be all the complex such that H minus 1 of this complex uh, is in F, and HI of this complex is 0, or I is smaller than negative 1. And also, take uh, D is smaller than or equal to zero to be those things whose H zero is in T and H I a zero for positive I. Okay, so you can check this is the T structure on the uh, uh, yeah, F is F S. And this is T S. So basically, this is a t, t structure on the derived category depending on this s. Okay, yeah, and uh, you can write down the heart of this thing, which is the thing I call this a s here. And also, you can write down the central charge of the, of this stability condition, uh, which depends on both this s and this positive number t. So this is a function from uh, the numerical gross and group of this derived category to C. And yeah, so basically I, I will just copy down the formula here. So this is, you know, negative DTS, which is the real part, plus I times RTS. And you get, I never remember the formula, you get complicated formulas for this. So this is negative RT squared divided by 2 plus 
s squared divided by 2 minus 1 of r minus 3 plus s c1 plus chi okay and uh, r t s is c1 minus r s times t oh by the way for every time i say c c i say c1 i mean just a number there's a multiple of o1 on this p2 okay yeah so basically this you can check those so this thing defines a bridge land stability condition on p2 and uh, yeah, the main ingredients is this uh, Bob model of inequality on surface. Okay, so good. So then what we have here is just a, you know a family of uh, bridge land stability condition, which you know form the upper half plane. And so what's the thing? So the good thing about this thing is I can really consider this so-called walls. And since I'm just considering the Huber scheme here, I'll just fix the numerical invariant. V1, 0, 1 minus n. So this is the rank, this is the first term class, and this is the Euler character. Okay? So what, what do I mean by this wall? So basically, I just mean like, so you consider all the s and t such that, uh, yeah, I didn't say what, what's the slope of this thing. So this, for every s and t, I define the slope of uh, something to be just, you know, d of this thing over s, t of or t of this thing. No. Like something wrong. Yeah. So every for every element inside here, I take a numerical class and I can uh, consider a function on this thing. And the slope of that object is just this quotient. Okay? Yeah. So this walls are basically I just take <coughs> consider the slope of this numerical class and are required to be the same as the slope of some other thing. C1 prime, chi prime. Okay, so yeah, so basically you can define for any numerical class this such a wall. But the thing we care is like, so if this is really the numerical class of some sub-object of this thing, yeah, yeah, that's the wall we care here. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so basically if you draw the picture. So the wall on this upper half plane is something look like this. So it's, uh, so once you fix a numerical class here, it's just a, fam a family of nested semicircles. And so you know something more. So the center of this, so if let's say the center of this thing is x comma zero, the center is always on the x, s axis. And then the radius of this thing is uh, square root of x squared plus 2n. Okay? Yeah. But the thing is, like, once even I fix this and I just only consider that, you know, the. Sorry? Uh, just arbitrary real, num arbitrary real number. Yeah, depend on this numerical class. So, a priori, you know, like, there could be infinite, infinitely many different types of sub object. So there could be infinitely many walls. And I'll show you in a moment, so there are only like finitely many actual walls. Okay? Yeah, so this is the first part of the story. Yeah, and I want to mention one thing here. So when this S is negative, and I take a sufficiently positive T, so you can consider the moduli space of semi-stable <coughs> object with respect to such a, a stability condition as T and of numerical class 1, 0, 1 minus n. It's not terribly hard to show this thing is just the same as Huber scheme of n point on P2. Okay? So basically, if you pick a uh, stability condition here, you know, like when t is sufficiently positive, and then what you get here as the moduli space is just uh, the Huber scheme of points on P2. Yeah. So basically, the the whole idea, the whole philosophy of this work is like I start from this point and I work uh, in, in this direction. So every time I hit a wall, you know, like the slope of some sub-object will be the same as the slope of this, uh, of the original thing. That means that thing is destabilized at this wall. And when you cross the wall, then you know, like you get some, some new thing which is stable and you hope like the moduli space behaves like a birational transformation. Yeah, but at the end, I'll show like this is really the picture. But there are some 
uh, details to show. Yeah, so first thing is we don't really know like there are only finitely many worlds. And the second thing is I don't really know like for every point here, the moduli space like this really exists as a projective space. There's just no priori reason why that's true. Yeah, but yeah, so this is the, the first way to construct the stability. So basically I'll introduce the second way to construct stability on P2. And this really solved these two problems uh, as I just mentioned. So I just call, call this thing AK and Z, and vector Z, I'll explain what it means. And also quiver region. Yeah, so what's this AK? So let's just consider this AK to be this thing spanned by, you know, O of K minus one, and I shift it by two. And also you take OK, shift by one, and you take OK plus one some integer k, okay? And by span, I mean you can only do extension, you cannot do holomorphic, uh, homological shift. I just consider this thing. And then you realize, okay, it's very easy to realize this thing as the heart of some T structure on the derived category of cohesion shifts on P2. And with respect to this heart, I just want to define the stability condition. And you know like, but this, this is really just spanned by this three line bundle. And all the objects inside this this abelian category I just of the form, you know, OK minus one to some direct sum several times, and you map to OK, direct, direct sum is several times, and you map to OK plus one, direct sum. Okay, so all the object inside this uh, category is like this. And in, part in particular, if you consider a sub-object of this object with some fixed number here, so what could be subject object of this thing? And so it's only the thing like this with smaller numbers here, right? And these numbers must be positive. So in particular, for every object like this, you have you have only finitely many different types of sub object. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. So this is the heart. This is the heart of some T structure. And so I want to construct stability condition. So how do I construct this central charge function? That's even more easier, right? So this thing is only spanned by this three line bundle. So what I need to do, I just want to associate to each line bundle just a <coughs> number, z zero, uh, z, min z minus one, z zero, and z one, which which is in, you know in the yeah. For this central charge, you require the uh, value of this function on this heart to be inside the upper half plane like this. So basically, you just pick three arbitrary numbers inside this upper half plane, and then you associate them to this three line bound. That's it, right? That's just the bridge land stability condition. Okay? Yeah, and I'll call this thing z as a vector. So basically, this vector z is this. That's it. Okay? Yeah, so this is the second way to construct this bridge land stability condition on P2. Okay, so then the natural question for us is like, so I have two ways to construct a uh, bridge land stability condition on P2. And how to compare these two things? Okay, and it turns out to be a, a simple answer for this thing. So the thing is, so if you take this S and T satisfying this inequality, so S minus K squared plus T, K, T squared is smaller than one, and this k is just some, some, uh, some integer. And basically, th this stability condition AS, yeah, this stability condition AS CTS is equivalent, I'll explain what I mean by this, to some AK Z for some vector Z. For some vector, you can find a vector Z such that these two are equivalent. And by equivalent, I mean, so there's a, a group action. Th there's an action of GL2R plus tuta on the space of all this, on, on the space of all this bridge land stability conditions. And so these two are uh, in the same orbit under this group action. So in particular, if you consider the modulized space, 
of Simon stable or stable object with respect to this stability condition is the same as you know the thing with respect to this stability condition. So yeah. But is there some Z change or is there some Z? Some Z. You just consider dimension. That thing is of complex dimension three. But here just have you know just have a plane. So just some Z inside. Sorry? Oh, in, inside this situation, once you fix that one zero, one minus n, this is a family of nested walls. Yeah, that's important. And that also follows from the thing I write there. You just check like with center and that radius, they don't really intersect. Okay. So, okay, yeah. So, so what's the upshot of this thing? So, the upshot of this thing give us the first thing. So, there exist only finitely many, finitely many actual walls. So, why is that? So, if you think about the picture, so you, so basically, the picture is like you have all these walls, and you have some, some semi-circle here, which have a, uh, yeah, I'll call this thing quiver region. So every such a semi-circle is called a quiver region. For the reason you'll just see very soon. And for inside each quiver region, you know like the, you know like the, f there are only finitely many types of sub-object for every fixed type, n minus one, n zero, and n one. So that basically means for inside each quiver region, so for each quiver region, it can only intersect with finitely many actual destabilizing walls. And is it okay? Yeah. Right, yeah. So the first thing is to show for every quiver region, you, it intersects with only finitely many actual walls, okay? And the second thing is, you notice the formula I wrote there, and you will see the right corner of the oldest wall lies inside a finite interval on this, on this race, on this uh, uh, S-axis. So basically, I think it's negative square root of 2n to 0. So, and inside this part, there are only finitely many quiver regions. So that basically shows us so there could be only yeah, actual walls. So, so, the good, so if you think about all this thing, the good thing is like inside, inside for this kind of, inside that AK, so for every numerical class, there are only finite many types of sub-object. That's the, the, main, the main thing here. Okay? Yeah, so we solve like kind of the first problem. Yeah, so the third part I want, I want to show like, so it's really easier to study the moduli of semi-stable stable object inside this quiver region. So this third part is the construction of moduli in quiver region. So how do we do this? So first is the observation. So let's fix some a, k, and z here. Fix the numeric uh, stability condition. And first is the observation, let, 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 let me just define the vector first. So assume this z is, you know, the real part A plus i times the imaginary part B. And I assume I fix the numerical type here, which is n minus 1, and 0, and, and 1. Okay, so consider this vector rho, which is uh, negative A plus B times the inner product A or an inner product B. Okay, so what do, what's the good thing about this row? So there are two things. First, so this row is, uh, sorry, this row inner product with N is zero. That's by computation, you, you just check it directly. Okay, and second, so if you have a, E belongs to this AK, and it's of type M, of the type N, Okay, you know by of type M, I mean it's, it can be written as a 
as a complex in, in that way. So then basically, you, f you see that this E is stable. And by stable, I mean stable with respect to this stability condition. If and only if for any proper sub-object E prime, and I assume this E prime is of numerical type N prime for some vector N prime, then we have this N prime inner product with this row is smaller than zero. Okay, this, this is kind of trivial. This is just basically a, a way to rewrite this, this uh, stability here. Okay, but what's the upshot? So this is the theorem proved uh, in this paper by Akira, Bertram, Kostlin, and Huizinga. But what's really used here is the result by King. So the thing is like, if you consider the modulized space of semi-stable object with respect to this AK and Z. So yeah, I consider modulized space of semi-stable object inside this hard AK and it's uh, semi-stable with respect to the stability condition. So this can be really constructed as the GIT quotient, sorry, as the GIT quotient. Yeah, I will explain X and this G in a minute. <coughs> As a GIT quotient, uh, this is uh, over some variety with a group, and you fix the character here to be this row. Okay, so there's a small issue whether you can pick this row as an in, in, uh, integral vector, but it's okay since, you know, there are only finitely many different types of sub-object. And the property I only want to insist is this one. So basically, you just know, move it a little bit and pick a uh, integral uh, vector there. Yeah, so what's this x? So x is uh, the, the sub-scheme contained in a uh, home from ok minus 1 and minus 1 time to ok and 0 cross home you know, from ok and 0 to ok plus 1 and one, and you know th this is such that the composition, the composition of this two home is zero. Yeah, I just want to con consider a complex in, in this form. <coughs> okay, this is X, and what's G? So this G is basically just, you know, GL, then minus one cross GL, and zero cross GL, and one, and you remove the the, the, the the common diagonal inside it, okay? And this character, this character row is, yeah, so this is just, you know, determinant to n minus one, determinant to n zero, determinant to n one. It's a tensor of the character. Okay, so check this is well defined. So basically, yeah, so basically the thing is like for every stability condition in this quiver region, you can really construct uh, the modulized space of some stable object as a GIT quotient, okay? And so, uh, so good. So basically for every point in the quiver region, I know how to construct the modulized space. It's just projective variety. And then the thing is like without touching the wall, you can really move to anywhere. The modulized space doesn't change, right? So basically, I know like for every point on this plane, you can, the modular space is really just projective uh, scheme, which is not a uh, priorily true. Yeah. Uh, So, sorry, what's the question? So the X is the X is in the 
Also er existiert, das wird nicht gut sein. Das wird der Propagation nicht gestört. Let's see. Uh, so Yeah, the quotient is irreducible. Let's see. So I see. So, so maybe you need to take a component of something in this. Yeah. So probably I missed the component. Do I? Yeah. So maybe I need to take a component in this. Let, let me. Yeah. Let me think about it. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so let me think about this and maybe tell you later. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so this is the first part I want to say. So that, yeah, so at the end, hopefully, we can show like all this modular space are, are projected. Okay, yeah, so this is, so all what I said are basically esta uh, established in this paper by this ABCH, this four people. So then they stop here and try to compute the first several examples for n equals uh, nine, uh, two, sorry, two to nine. So somehow Chun Yi and I work out this parallel uh, theoretic story, and that's what I'm going to present next. this. So the second part is just how I run this MMP for Huber scheme of point on P2. Okay. Yeah. So how do I do this? So first, let me just recall something basic. So you have the Huber Chow morphism from the Huber scheme of point on P2 uh, to the symmetric product of P2, okay? And yeah, so I'll call the delta to be the exceptional divisor of this morphism. And I'll call this H to be, you know, just you, you pull back the O1 on this thing via this morphism. So basically, at, at, at least over uh, Q, this two thing generated a Picard generated the Picard group of this Huber scheme. Basically, you have delta here and you have H here. Okay? Yeah. So, so, so this is basically a recall. And the, fir the first main theorem by 
clean E and I is basically the following. So for a generic, for a generic uh, AK and this vector Z, so for a generic stability condition in the quiver region, and by generic, I mean, so it's not on any wall, not on walls. Okay, so yeah, remember we can construct this model. So for, the, for such a stability condition, I get a vector rho here. And I can construct the moduli space as a geometric, uh, geometric quotient. Hopefully, we can figure out this, this choosing component problem in, inside in this way. And so we can really prove this thing is smooth and irreducible. Okay, or empty. It could be empty. Okay, yeah. So this is like the first main claim in our paper. Oh, that one. Uh, yeah, that one. That, that, uh, yeah. So basically, I'm just saying, like, for generic row, uh, for generic row in this quiver region, the GIT quotient there is smooth and irreducible. Okay, and so this should correspond to the birational model of this Hilbert scheme of point on P2. Okay? Okay? Yeah, so, yeah, let me. Just say the, the, the key technical lemma we used in this proof. So, so what's the key lemma here? So, so the key lemma is, so yeah. So if, let's say I have a F, which is uh, stable with respect to some uh, AKZ, okay? So then we can really show the X yeah, the, the home, let me just write home, from this f to f twisted by 2 is really 0. Okay, that's the main technical lemma uh, we proved in this paper. And yeah, so let me briefly say how this was shown. So the thing is like, to so consider this, 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 this thing of this upper half plane of uh, stability condition. And yeah, so you just consider the walls I draw before. So you have a wall such that this F is, you know, is always slow, uh, stable along this wall, along the wall I draw before. And now you consider this F twisted by negative three. The, the main point is use, to use the side duality here. So it's, it's also stable along some other wall. Now this, yeah, let me just write in this way. So basically, you have a wall W here, and you move it to the left by three, uh, by, by three and you get this wall. Let, let me just write in this way, okay? So if you assume, like, for example, the, wall, the radius of this wall, so the first case is, like, if the radius of this wall is really greater than or equal to three over two, then you know, like, this two wall intersect. And assume they intersect at some stability condition S1, T1. And then the upshot is like you really can compare the slope of F and F twisted by 2. Sorry, F uh, twisted, shifted, or twisted by negative 3 at this common uh, intersection. Okay. And here by the formula, you can really compute the slope of uh, F, the slope of F uh, twisted by negative 3, and you'll see an inequality between these two. So the yeah so the so in this way you can really show the home of f f twisted by three is really zero, which is you know which implies this thing. Okay, question. Yeah, basically, I want to find a wall such that this F is always stable on that wall. Okay? 
And so, so basically, you, you know, like, so maybe I start from some arbitrary uh, stability condition here. But if these two walls intersect, I can really compare this, the, slope of, the slopes of these two objects at this intersection. Since they are both stable, and so if the slope that give us inequality, basically I'm done. Okay, that's the, the main idea of this. Huh? Okay, yeah, and yeah, this, this, uh, there's another case. So if the radius is smaller than three over two, and so there are some similar trick, but you need to play also with the quiver regions. Yeah, so that's that's the the, the, the key technical technical lemma in this thing, and then then the thing is like basically estimation of dimensions. So so what's the benefit of this lemma? So basically, so what we want to really estimate is the x to one of something, and this lemma tells us we don't need to worry about x two, and for some simple reason we also don't need to worry about home since they are basically home between stable object. So this x1 becomes just the Euler character. And that's really easy to estimate. And that's the, the, the main thing of, of this theory. Okay, yeah, so now this is uh, the first main theorem. And so, yeah, so basically, then we can really play the game. So the idea is like I let the stability move in the quiver region. So you know, like when that thing moves, the, uh, the associated stability a k z really varies, and when this d varies, you know the the the, the vector rho varies, and that gives us a, a, a question in the variation of GMP. So basically, I'm varying the the character of that group, and I study the what, what changes on the GIT quotient. Okay, yeah. So basically, the the, the next part is I do this wall crossing while this VGIT. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so let me just maybe just, just say say the say the result here. So the result result is you have on this uh, upper half plane of state stability conditions and you have several walls on this thing. So basically and on the other hand you have this uh, P, P car group tensor Q of this uh, P2. So you have H here and you have delta here. So basically for every actual dis destabilizing wall, it's corresponding to a wall inside the pseudo effective cone. Yeah, it's corresponding to a wall inside the pseudo effective cone of this uh, Huber and P2. So once you go across the wall, then basically here you go across the wall in the uh, uh, pseudo-effective cone and the birational model changes. So basically our result here re is that if you see, if you pick line bundle sitting inside the chamber of this decomposition, then the birational model is smooth. And when you go across wall here, so there are only different three, uh, there are really three different things could happen. So while crossing wall, uh, while crossing walls, so there are uh, three different things could happen. So the first thing is that when you stand the wall, you get a birational morphism. So if that morphism is small, and so there's one thing I didn't say. So if you stand down to the wall from inside, so this this birational morphism is always small. Okay. So if the outside uh, morphism is also small, and basically it's by a theorem in this VGIT saying like the two birational models here are, are actually flip. Okay. So the first thing is while crossing the wall, you get a flip. And so you know that Picard number is still two, and you can continue. And so there, the, second, the second possibility is, when you stand onto a wall, there's a divisorial contraction. But you know on the other side, so this, that's a small uh, contraction, and it doesn't recover the Picard number. So the Picard number becomes one. So this, so the second possibility is the divisorial contraction. And after that, uh, uh, P, the Picard number becomes one, and the MMP really ends at next wall. OK, 
Okay? And there's a third property, a possibility. So if you stand down to the wall and so you know like the dimension of the uh, variety becomes sm smaller. So what happens here is uh, just a more refabrication and that's the end of time MP. So the third possibility is it really contracts the dimension and what you get here is more refabrication. So basically, we show like the the one-to-one -one correspondence between actual wall here and the walls in the uh, people call it stable based locus decomposition in the pseudo effective core. And in particular, you know this is the net core, and this is the pseudo effective core. Okay, let's assume this is the last one. And so, yeah, so, so there's one more thing I want to say. So this wall, this wall really corresponding to this line, which is corresponding to the, you know, the Hubert Chow morphism from Hubert scheme to the symmetric product. So the vertical wall here, this thing corresponding to the Hubert Chow morphism. Okay? Okay. Yeah, so this is the second part. So how to run this MMP for Hubert scheme of points on P2 via this wall crossing. Yeah, I have to have to rush to the third part. So as my title is the, about the MMP for deformation of Hubert scheme of points on P2. So the third part I want to introduce like how to construct and how to construct this deformations of uh, MP2. Why it is so called Scliani algebra. Lianian algebra. Okay? Yeah. So, what's the story? So, let me first define this Lianian algebra. So, th this depends on three things. So, take E, take a line among the L, and take a sigma. Where this E is a elliptic, e is a elliptic curve embedded into P2. So let me restrict ourselves to the smooth elliptic curve case. Okay, and this L is just a pullback. Let me call this thing maybe tall or something. L is just a rest restriction of O1 to this EP curve. And also this sigma is the automorphism of this EP curve by translation. By translation. So basically pick a point on the EP curve. So once I have this three parameter, then I can define the algebra in this way. So let, let me say this V is just a global section over the EP curve of this line bundle L. Okay? And inside this V tensor V, which can be viewed as, you know, the global section over E tensor E cross E of this L tensor L, I consider a subspace inside it, which is the global section over E cross E of L tensor L. And I twist it by the graph of this automorphism. I twist by the graph of this automorphism. Okay. And so, yeah, let me call this this subspace maybe R. So the thing is, now 
inside the tensor algebra of V, this is the tensor algebra of V. And you quotient all the double side ideal generated by this R. And this thing is the Scalia-Yani algebra, you know, determined by this three, by this three parameters. Okay, so this is a definition of this Scalia-Yani algebra. Okay, yeah. So for, for this one, it could be it's the, it's arbitrary. Yeah. So later, I will restrict ourselves to the non-torsion case. And I'll, I'll say that later. Okay. So basically, this is the Scalianian algebra. And so, yeah, so in particular, if you take this C, theta to be the identity, you see what you caution out here is just a wedge algebra. And you end up with just you know, the polynomial ring of three variables. Or another way, just the homogeneous coordinate ring of P2. So, and, but in general, this algebra is just non-commutative. You, you should view this as a non-commutative deformation of the polynomial ring of three variables. And yeah, so and what's the upshot? Uh, what's the importance of this thing? So basically, you can define this, yeah, so this GRS to be the, uh, this k the Nosorin, the category of Nosorin object, yeah, in the graded, uh, graded uh, right S module. Okay, so you have such a category, and inside it you have a category of you know right bounded, right bounded uh, S module. So by S bounded, I mean you know like this M I is zero, or I is sufficiently large. Yeah, S is graded. Yeah, the, the grading comes from yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. What? Sorry, I, I, I. Okay. Yeah, then I form the quotient of this thing. For that, I call it QGRS, which is quotient by, okay. So you see, like, so if this S is the uh, polynomial ring, I'm doing nothing but constructing, you know, the category of coherent uh, of coherent shapes on S. Is it only to do the prime of the generator of the numbers, or you take anything inside the general algebra? Infinite. Uh, um, Right, I I, yeah, I, I should say I'm really not expert on this part of the story. So maybe we talk about this later. I think from the paper is yeah. written. So it's from paper of uh, Thomas Nevins and Stafford. So yeah. That's how they constructed this. I, I think they wrote in the paper this right bounded uh, modules. Okay. Yeah, and you form this quotient. So, uh, how to say? I, yeah. Yeah. So let me just say. So, so in this in this category, you can really talk about uh, everything. Just when you talk about like coherent shift, what you need, you can say rank. You can see chain class, Euler character, and torsion, torsion free. All this thing can be phrased for object in this uh, category. Okay. And so the the main ingredients here is the following theorem by uh, Nevins and Stafford. Yeah, 
So, so what's the important thing? So the first thing is like if you consider derived category of this thing, consider derived category of thing, this thing, it's uh, really just spanned by, well, I haven't said what this are. So the thing is like you consider this, just consider this S, which is in this category, and it naturally give, give you an object, I'll call it O inside this grid, inside this quotient. And you, when you shift it, you get, you know, like, OK, OK, minus 1, all this stuff. And you just. Sorry. So you're saying this is right. OK, thanks. Train is really, yeah, he's a student of Nevins, and he take care of all this. Right, uh, yeah, you can do extension, you can do hom homological shape. Okay, and so the second thing is, so there's really a way to construct the, so once you fix a Scliani algebra, let me call it this S, and there's a way to, there, there's a way to construct the moduli space of a uh, semi-stable object with numerical class 1, 0, 1 minus n, okay? And this moduli space is smooth, smooth projective. And this is, yeah, this is moduli of torsion-free modules inside this category of numerical class 1, 0, 1 minus n. Okay? Yeah. And so the thing is like, so if you have a family, a flat family of such algebra, then this moduli space really are uh, existing family. And so if you take the uh, the polynomial ring of three variables, then this is nothing but a Hilbert scheme of points on P2, okay? And so in particular, you know, like, this thing is a deformation, and this is deformation of Hilbert scheme of points on P2. Okay? Yeah, so let me just write in this way. This is the theorem by uh, Nevins and Stafford. Uh, no, actually, so you see, like, there are many, there are 10 dimensional or something such algebra, but essentially there are only two dimensions. So a lot of them are, are you know, like, you, they, even from the algebra, they are isomorphic to each other. Questions? Complaints? <laughs> I think so. They are, they, are, they, are, they are different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is basically the main ingredients why we can do the, the do all the similar picture for uh, deformation of Hilbert P two. So the, the last part is MMP for deformations. Okay. So here I really need to do some assumption. I need this. You have a sigma, which is the uh, which is an uh, automorphism of this elliptic curve. I need the order of this thing to be infinity. So basically, you don't pick a torsion point. And also, I need the number n to be here to be at least three. Okay? Yeah, so for n equals two, something weird happens. I, I, yeah, so I need n to be at least three. So, yeah, so let me really just quickly say what happens. So basically, everything I said, you can just do it similarly for this, uh, for uh, for this category, for the derived category of this thing, and you can uh, construct bridge land stability condition on this derived category, and you get similar picture. There's the upper half plane, and there are some walls inside it, and also you get this quiver regions uh, on this on this uh, upper half plane of bridge land stability conditions. And also, for every point inside this quiver region, you can construct uh, the modulized space in a similar uh, GIT quotient way. So, and yeah, and moreover, you can show like for a stability condition not on the walls, 
and the modular space you constructed is really smooth and irreducible. So basically everything I said works through also in this non-commutative case, except only one difference. So what's the thing uh, different here? This is uh, pretty much easy to guess. So you know like the vertical wall there corresponding to the to the edge, to the pullback of the uh, O1, and it's corresponding to the Hubert Chow morphism. But in this situation, we fortunately we get you know a, a modular space existing as the projective scheme, but we don't really know what's the symmetric product of some non-commutative P2 is. So it's suggesting like there must be something different happening on this vertical wall. And so basically, once you go through the, the, the construction and compute like the wall crossing over this vertical wall, so what, what happens is like, so the, 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 the wall crossing, the vertical wall crossing, the vertical wall crossing induces an automorphism of this, induces a, an automorphism of this uh, deformation of Huber scheme. An let me just say that. Automorphism. So basically, there's no curve contracted when you stand onto the wall. And also, on the other side, there's no curve contracted. So if you compare these two smooth directional stuff, they are just isomorphic to each other. And when you go across the wall, this is really an automorphic. This is really an involution, actually. And if you consider the induced action of this involution on the narrow subway group on the Picard, and the induced action on uh, this Picard Q, it's really non-trivial. It's a reflection. So yeah, so uh, I didn't say like for all this deformation, the narrow salary group is uh, the Picard number is still two. So it's again a two-dimensional space. And on this side, you have something like this, right? And so when you go across this vertical wall, this the induced action is really reflection with respect to this thing. And so this by basic computation, you can see the walls on the left hand side of this upper half plane and on the right hand side of this plane are basically symmetric to each other. So once you start from something here and you go here, get to involution, and you cross the wall here, the divisor is symmetric to the wall, the wall crossing, the divisor of the wall crossing here. So basically what you get here is a symmetric decomposition of this uh, pseudo-effective cone. Yeah, so this is basically the main picture. So inside this thing you get the nap cone, and so the biggest thing is the pseudo-effective cone of this deformation. And so you, you do work crossing in this way, then basically you do work crossing in this way. And if you uh, do in this way, then you get something like this, okay? So this is the, the main theorem for the deformations. So basically the, uh, the decomposition is, the, the, the stable based locus decomposition of the effective cone of this, uh, of this deformation is asymmetric and one-to-one -one one -one correspondence to the walls on the left and also on the right plane. Okay? Yeah, let's see. Okay, that's it. That's what I want to say. Thanks. Thank you. You mean um, should have a tuting bundle on the Huber scheme? Well, the, the okay. Okay. No, I I I, I Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, 
think the, the main point seems to be that you realize that the multiplied spaces as a you know via a silver multiplied process so as a DLT process. But the DLT process also comes with a nine but little cubes from the DLT process, right? So some power of the polarizing thing up there produces things so you can really detect maybe even the the first. But uh, so there's also this other construction of the Right. Uh, yeah. Which look very analytical. Um, so is this somehow compatible the construction of the multiplied space and the DIT quotient? Is this can you see the picture right. sort of if you yeah. choose a class um, and look at the class that they construct and you see it are somehow seen in the DIT construction? So basically there are three yeah. So uh, I guess this is your question. So on one hand we, we yeah, we have this VGIT. And on one hand, we have all these birational models. And on the other hand, we have this, uh, you know, like to construct this modulized space really condition. So here, there's a ample divisor or something constructed by McCree and Bayer in their paper. And on this VGIT, we can pick a, you know, once we fix the character, we have a line, ample line model. I think it's proved in a recent paper by Aaron Bertram. So this, uh, these two things are actually corresponding to each other. Uh, not only for Hubert's theme, even for coherent sheaves of certain fixed numerical type on P2. But I didn't really uh, go through this paper. I, the impression I got is something like this. Are you so this work of Bertram? Bertram uh, and two of his uh, postdocs, I think, yeah. Jiang and. So that's only for P2? Or? For P2, for P2. No, I do not. I I know up to five, I think. So what to yeah, let me say two, two, three, four. That's, that's are easy. So for two, it's very simple. So if I have two points and you draw a line, that's a point in P2 dual. So basically, there's only one thing happening. You, you get a Mori fabrication. And fiber is P2, the base is P2 dual. Okay? For n for n equals three, you you see the divisorial contraction for the first time. So it was contract is like three point on a line. Okay? So for n equals four, it's a little bit more complicated since you see a flip for the first time. And after the flip is a divisorial contraction. Uh, I think it's also like I think it's also four points on the line. So that thing gives you the flip. That thing give you, gives you the first small contraction, and you recover something on the other side. Uh, you, you know, basically, the thing here is uh, you get O minus 1 mapped to some ideal sheaf, and you have a quotient. So what you replace is just, you know, the extension of this thing by this thing. So that's, uh, that's what you get back on the other side. But for n equals five, it's already a little bit complicated. So yeah, the, the main reason is like, um, yeah, th I don't really understand what's happening. On last wall, there's divisorial contraction. But there's also a part of some small, look like a small contraction. So basically, yeah, I'm just saying like, on the last wall, not only a divi divisor is contracted, but also something else. And I, I, I don't really completely understand. But yeah, I should say it's really a, very computative, very practical way to go across all these walls. So you can really compute almost everything. There was this n equals 143, I think. So yeah, so this uh, is that Coskin asked us this question. Let's just pick an arbitrary large number, I guess. And eventually it's nice. So on the last wall, the base is something like, a, I think it's a grass many of dimension 46. And fiber are P230. I think that's, yeah. There's a set of inequalities in the paper which can really narrow down the possible type of sub-objects. Yeah. So it's not terribly hard to compute. That's 